loss, a lack of hearing or a drop in what you can hear turns the brain off and it actually uh, really penalizes you. Uh, the risk of falling increases by 40%, but a much higher rate of depression and chronic anxiety. This is the one that was really scary. Uh, 700 normal people, they were followed for 15 years. The more hearing loss, the higher the rate risk of dementia. Because probably if you're not using your hearing, you're shutting off a part of the brain and it all works on a feedback system. So if you're not you're using that part of the brain, you're probably not using another part of the brain. Now, this was presented uh, for a group that sells hearing aids, but you know what? They've got a point. <laughs> no, they do have a point. You want to make sure that if you're not hearing, that you take uh, good care of it. And of course, as always, we talk about men being at high risk. Who's, uh, who's most at risk for hearing loss? Um, I saw this study the, uh, a few weeks ago, men who use Viagra. Uh, I'm not saying that there's a connection between here and, uh, and uh, the reason that men use the Viagra, but Viagra, using Viagra on a serious note um, for men who do have to use it, adds a marker that uh, some of the rest of your uh, circulatory system isn't working as well as it should. Uh, the one change that I think everybody can do a little bit of, um, if they adapt it right, is exercise. Frank Hughes, the world's most famous epidemiologist, he says if exercise were a pill, we would all be taking one a day. Um, I don't, you know, this is a study by uh, Marmot. Uh, I don't know where they found 10,000 British civil servants with a brain, but they did. Um, <laughs> anyway, they followed them, and what they did is they, they he, Marmot, who's one of the uh, terrific, he does a, a series of studies called the Whitehall Studies, and so much of what we know about the importance of lifestyle comes from his studies. Anyway, for him, uh, his conclusion was low physical activity was a key, um, a key factor in determining uh, levels of fluid intelligence. Fluid intelligence is deciding whether or not to stop at a stop sign, deciding whether or not you should eat something instead of something. It's the kind of decisions you make all day that you rely on, and once you lose it, you lose all your confidence. It's one of the things that happens to old people. Well, the more sedentary they were, the lower their level of fluid intelligence. And of course, this is from Miriam Nelson, who runs this terrific center at uh, John, John Hancock. And she underlines the fact that for s the older you get, the more important physical activity becomes, particularly in this, in independence and having a full life. Um, all the exercise, you guys all know this. I'm not going to spend any time on this. It's in your slides anyway, think fit. I, I want you to think of exercise this way, OK? I want you to think of it with these, this acronym. Why is that? Why, why, why would I focus on that? What's one of the biggest health threats to so, much of the, so many of the members of this audience? Falling. Falling, that's right. You all know that. You understand that. You have to adapt your home to change that. Well, the other two things you have to do, that's why I started this damn yoga class this morning, was because my balance is really crummy, and I want to improve my balance. Um, the other thing that in, uh, reduces the risk of falling is building up weights. You, uh, I forget the number, it's something like 1% of your muscle function is lost every year over the age of 40. But you can slow that down significantly by starting to do weight programs. So if you remember Bart, um, I think it was Larry Diane uh, who gave a, a talk at this thing, and I think he's, he's the one who said it. If not him, it was another gerontologist. Once you get over the age of 65, aerobic exercise becomes much less important. It's not that it's not important, and if you can do it, sure, do it. It's important to keep it up. But these two become significantly more important in terms of, of your prognosis. Up until the age of 65, sure, aerobics. After that, not. Okay, three simple fitness studies. This, this is cute, eh? from The Onion, 32 shoppers stranded for six hours when an escalator breaks down in a mall. I, I work downtown in a mall in uh, the Wall Center, and there's a lot of medical conventions in the Wall Center, and the ballroom where the uh, conventions, conventioners meet for their sessions is on the third floor. Starbucks is on the ground floor. You will never see a doctor on the stairs going from Starbucks to the convention center. They're lined up 10 deep for the elevators and the escalators. Mm -hmm. It's so depressing. It's because we've learned to live like that. These are doctors. They don't walk. What we should do, I, learned that I read this many, many years ago. It's from George Sheehan, the guru of the fitness movement, a wise, wise old man. And he said, the only thing you ever really need to become fit is to live in a two-story house. <laughs> and have a very poor memory, right? <laughs> Just learn to do more on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, when I was in medical school, I got 
reamed out by one of my residents. I, I used to weigh about 40, 45 pounds more. I used to smoke. You want to know how ugly I was? I had a ponytail. I was an ugly dude. Um, yeah, they all thought I would become a psychiatrist. <laughs> um, I got reamed out by one of my, um, one of my, not my residents, my staff ladies. Uh, I forget her name now. <laughs> I, forget, I forget what I had for breakfast, but I forgot her name. Um, and uh, she stood there. I was waiting for an elevator to go one flight of stairs. That's it. And she said, Hister, for the rest of your life, you're going to see my uh, face on your shoulder. It's three, sto three stories up, six stories down. Use the bloody stairs. And you know what? Every time I think of waiting for an elevator, I see her face, and I do that. Three stories up, six stories down. It's amazing how often I'm the only person on the stairs. <laughs> but it works. Teach yourself to do that. It's very simple. This one, uh, this is Tonka. Tonka is a 110-pound Rottweiler. Oh. The gentlest, sweetest soul that you've ever met. This is the nicest dog, the nicest being. Take a look at these eyes. Twice a day, Tonka goes to the back door and sits and looks at me. <laughs> you tell him you're not going out for a walk, okay? Twice a day, I have to take Tonka out for a walk, whether I like it or not. He doesn't care if it's raining. He doesn't care if it's snowing. He doesn't care how bad I feel. He wants to go out for a walk. And you know I do it, and it's the best thing I do all day long. <laughs> two reasons. One, I get my exercise. So I know I went for two walks that day. Two, and this is really important, is it's really social. You meet so many other people. Yeah. Hey, you know, that Rottweiler won't bite you. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, no, you do. You meet a hell of a lot of people. Um, you meet other dog owners. You meet people who come up. And guys, women love Rottweilers. Oh, yeah. you know? <laughs> I don't know what the reason is, but if he dies, I'm getting another one. <laughs> In fact, you know, I'm thinking of getting a second one anyway. Um, they're unbelievable, and they're so friendly. It's, it's the best thing, if you can do it. Not everybody can do it, and not everybody lives in an environment where you can't have a dog, but it's a terrific way of getting around it. And I told you about working on your balance. I'm going to show you how bad my balance is. I'm in phenomenal uh, aerobic shape. We hike 25 miles with no problem, and I don't have any, any hassle with that. I'm, gonna sta I'm standing on one leg now. I'm standing on my favorite side. Everybody has a favorite side, so this is very easy for me to do. This is my non-favorite side, okay, after all this time. And I'm not having nearly as good a time, but I'm managing. Now watch, I'm gonna close my eyes. And I can't do that for three seconds. A kid will do it till you tell him the game's over. <laughs> That's what happens to your balance as you get older. And I actually work a bit on my balance, and it's gone downhill that much. So here's an easy trick. Uh, start with a simple routine. Brush your teeth standing only on one leg. All right? And then when you're good at that, close your eyes. Now, I got to tell you, it's a new era. You get complaints about everything, right? Oh, geez, I didn't know the uh, fire would start if I used matches. You know, you got to give a warning, okay? So I put this slide up in the small town. Two weeks later, I get an email. Dr. Hister, uh, I have to tell you, I hit my ear with my toothbrush. <laughs> okay, so the warning is, put the bloody toothbrush in your mouth before you close your eyes, okay? <laughs> Can you imagine this person? I should kept doing it, apparently. I know. <laughs> it's not your mouth. Okay, uh, what to eat? Okay, uh, you know, there are lots, there's lots of opinions about what makes the healthiest diet. Um, I love this one. Grant helps you live longer, but you spend the last 15 years on the toilet. And this is my favorite because I, I'm, I, God was sort of mean to me and made me live with a vegetarian. Um, I don't know what I did in my previous lives. But you don't have to be a vegetarian because, as Homer Simpson pointed out, if God didn't want us to eat animals, why did he make them out of meat, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> So what's in a Mediterranean diet? Well, what you got to know is there's 23 countries on the border of the Mediterranean. And uh, one thing is they all hate each other's guts. And the other thing is they all eat differently. The Lebanese hate the, uh, the Israelis and vice versa. Uh, the French, uh, the, everybody hates the French. The Italians, the Portuguese, the Spaniards. They all eat somewhat differently. But if you were to try to extract the commonalities in their diet, this is what sort of what you'd come up with. This is my version of it. I would focus on the veggies, the oils, and the beans. That's, those are really big beans, chickpeas, that kind of stuff. They eat a ton of that in those countries. Uh, and some of the rest of it. 
that would be the elements of a Mediterranean diet. But, you know, I always sell my own version of things, so uh, you have to know wine is a fruit, um, and coffee is a bean, okay? <laughs> uh, in case you needed more uh, convincing, and so is chocolate, okay? Uh, what else have we got up here? Okay, three or four very serious slides. Um, strokes, it's amazing how people don't recognize strokes when they're happening. And when you're talking to a senior audience, this is something you really have to underline. This is a study on the Mayo Clinic where they took a look at 220 people with post-secondary education, uh, post-secondary degrees. 60% didn't recognize their symptoms as a stroke. 50% didn't think speed mattered. So whatever else you remember, time is brain. The quicker you get to a hospital when you live in a city like Vancouver, the better your chance of leaving with a smaller deficit if you're having a stroke. Bill Teal, who ran, runs, still does, I, I don't know, I'm not up to date. He used to run the stroke clinic at uh, VGH. I think he still does. When I interviewed him on my show, uh, back when we were doing a live radio show, said that 37% of people who were visiting the uh, stroke unit at Vancouver General Hospital who got there within six hours left with zero deficit. Imagine that, 37% of the, that's astounding. Because in 20 years ago, you just got a stroke and that's what you were left with. I don't know what the statistics are now. This is a study that uh, Max Sinader from the Brain Research Center showed me and he showed, uh, this is a pretty depressing slide showing that we all have brain damage. Look at how much, these are the covert strokes. These are strokes that are happening to people and who don't know it. Take a look at these numbers, eh? So we're talking about these, recognizing the ones in the blue, not the other ones. So what are the symptoms of a stroke? You memorize this. And if you can't memorize it, you get a little fridge magnet that the Heart and Stroke Foundation hands out, put it on your fridge. They, they have all sorts of matchbox. I don't know what they have. They have uh, notepads. Memorize these strokes. So if you're ever sitting there with somebody and you're having lunch and they show sudden trouble speaking, they're garbling their words, or they're really confused, they don't know where they are, what do you do? <laughs> call 911. You don't call me to ask for things. You don't look up what Dr. Oz said. You call 911 and you get them to emergency. Time is brain. Oh, I also want to mention something about a heart attack. Um, yeah, well, you know what? I always have to tell, nobody cares what your underwear is like in the emergency department, okay? <laughs> Don't ever worry about that. What do you do if you think you're having a heart attack? First thing, 911. And what's the second thing? Aspirin. And what's the third thing? Open the door. Open the door. I, you know, I didn't know that. I did not know that. I got told that by a woman at a talk I was giving some months ago who told me that she'd forgotten to open the door and they had to bang it down to get her. So, okay, call 911. Then take an aspirin. Why? You're beginning to initiate blood thinning. Make sure the front door is unlocked and then relax. You know? <laughs> Just wait for the ambulance, but that's what you do. Um, and if you do that within three to six hours, there's a really good chance, depending upon the amount of damage you've had, that you leave a hospital with no damage at all. My friend, a really good friend of mine, called me four weeks ago having chest pain. His doctor missed the diagnosis. He called me. I said to him, you think you're having a heart attack? He drove himself to the emergency room. I was, I was actually going to drive out there and kill him before he got there. So <laughs> do not do that. Use your common sense. Now, the good news is he's OK. But you know, it's the dumbest thing you can do. I want to show you one other slide. This came in to me about three weeks ago after I did this. Because I do this regularly on Global to remind people. I live in Terrace, and on August 23rd, I had chest pain, numbness in my left arm, and nausea. So he went outside to get fresh air, which is what people do. He's not feeling well. But then I remembered what Dr. Art said. I don't know how. So I had a coworker drive me to hospital where they told me I was having a heart attack, and they got me on a plane to VGH for an angioplasty. 
I am fine now and on the road to recovery because I listened to Dr. Arts and he's gonna keep watching me on Global Well, one more viewer, we can't keep losing him. That's good, okay? But that's how it works. This is from Terrace and the guy left with an angioplasty and no damage. Let me wrap up here and then if you will have any questions, you can just come up to me privately afterwards and we can deal with them. Uh, are, you are you gonna live any healthier if you follow my advice? Isn't this cute from Red Fox? Health nuts are going to feel very silly one day lying in hospital dying of nothing. Uh, there's no guarantee. Uh, life isn't fair. I love this from Johnny Carson. If life were fair, Elvis would still be alive and all the impersonators would be there. <laughs> life isn't fair. No matter what happens, this is your future. This is what will happen to us, all of us. No matter how much tofu we eat, no matter how many marathons we run, no matter how little we smoke, we're all going to end up here. What you get if you follow the healthy lifestyle stuff I told you is you put this day off for as long as you can, you live with more energy, more uh, happiness, less chronic disease telescoped into a shorter period of life and it works. This is from George Valent who runs the longest study ever uh, going on, on on aging and he was quoted as saying, aging happy and well instead of sad and sick is under personal control. A successful old age may lie not so much in our stars and genes as in ourselves.